Security, I to check something, so we're a wee minute, uh, just a minute uh, starting uh, late. So I'm going to just formally start uh, the session uh, by saying good morning and welcoming everyone to the 13th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. And can I please just remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. We have received uh, apologies uh, once again from Richard Baker, but we look forward to him being back in the committee uh, in a fortnight. Um, we have only one item of business today, which is to continue to take evidence as part of our inquiry into Scotland's fiscal framework. I therefore like to uh, welcome to the meeting this morning Dr Angus Armstrong, uh, Professor Charlie Jeffrey, and Professor Nicola McEwen. So good morning to you all. Uh, members have received papers from each of our witnesses, so we'll go straight to uh, questions uh, from the committee. So I think I'll start with uh, you, your own, uh, Professor McEwen. Uh, and what I would say is that when I ask a question to any specific member of the panel, uh, please should other panellists feel free to come in with their own comments subsequently so everyone has a, an equal opportunity to make comments on uh, each other's uh, papers uh, where they wish to. So, Professor uh, uh, McEwen, you've said, uh, uh, and I quote, that managing the new fiscal framework will require more effective and institutionalised government relations than currently exist. Um, you also talk about, uh, in paragraph 1.6, that both the Smith Report and the UK Government Command Paper recognise the need for intergovernmental collaboration towards agreement on a new Scottish fiscal framework consistent with the UK fiscal framework. And uh, you go on to talk about things uh, where agreements need to be required, such as a block grant adjustment to reflect new tax raising powers and welfare responsibilities to reflect tax revenues foregone and spending no longer undertaken by the UK government. And finally, you talk about how the, this intergovernmental machinery needs to be scaled up. So I'm just wondering if you can uh, talk us through some of this a wee bit more for the record and tell us what some of the pitfalls are and how, we think, how you think we can actually take this matter forward successfully. I, mean, I think there's two things um, to, to bear in mind. First is the machinery for cooperation and coordination between the two governments, um, which at the moment is quite ad hoc. There's a mixture of multilateral forums like the Joint Ministerial Committee and bilateral forums like the Joint Exchequer Committee, um, the Finance Quadrilaterals, but um, it's not altogether clear um, what purpose they serve beyond sharing information, um, communicating what each level of government are doing. Um, it's, they certainly don't make decisions. The Joint Exchequer Committee is a little bit different because it seemed to be set up with the purpose of managing the transition of new powers emerging from Scotland Act 2012, um, although its terms of remit were never agreed uh, between the two governments. There was a little bit of a difference of opinion on what longer term purpose it should serve. Um, so it's all very informal. It's all very ad hoc. Um, the meetings are not all that regular. In the case of the Joint Exchequer Committee, we know it hasn't met for the last couple of years. Um, so lots of things get taken over at official level and the interactions between officials is very important but I think if there's more ministerial um, regular interaction then that can help to serve all of the other interactions as well and I think as we move towards a more complicated and complex uh, devolution settlement uh, then I think that the, the, those gaps the problems the weaknesses in intergovernmental cooperation become uh, more problematic so that's the first thing and the second thing is an issue for our parliament um, clearly, uh, there is um, a lack of reporting, a lack of accountability for intergovernmental relations. And I think, again, as, that forum, as those sorts of forums become more important, then the role of Parliament in scrutinising what they do, in scrutinising the relations between government, it becomes uh, more pressing, I think. Um, so there's a problem both in the relations themselves and in the accountability and the scrutiny of those relations that I think needs to be addressed. OK, so, so you need, what you're saying is that it should be certainly much more formal uh, arrangements. I think uh, it should, should be more be formal and I think it should be more transparent. Yes, I mean, one, one of the things that uh, the, the Scottish Parliament Information Centre say, uh, said in their report, too, which you may or may not have seen, is that... Uh, um, they, they quote uh, John Swinney in talking about the block grant adjustment. I mean, you will be familiar with that, but again, for the record, I'll read that out. And it says, there were two and a half years of evidence gathering different discussions, different research process and so on, but it was sorted out in a 15-minute conversation between the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. 
uh, which shows that if there's a will and a necessity to agree these issues, it can be agreed upon within a reasonable uh, time scale. Now, um, as, as Spice going to, uh, to comment, and you've already mentioned, these questions are raised transparency around decision making. Now, this committee itself to evidence in the Cabinet Secretary Treasury, the, uh, uh, Mr. Swinney himself, obviously. Uh, David Gawke at the Treasury and various other people and organisations. At the end of the day, it was sorted out in a kind of, a, a kind of telephone call. Is it? I mean, clearly that's no way to actually resolve things. Obviously, it had to be done at that very last minute because of a lack of agreement and we had a budget to to pass. But obviously, you would like to see more formal mechanisms where these things are, are resolved, given the fact that the block grant adjustment decision was, for example, only for one year and we're going to have to go through that again. Yeah. Uh, as I understand it, that 15-minute conversation uh, meant a conversation between one government's figure, the other government's figure, and they split the difference, um, which, you know, I know that sometimes politics works that way, but uh, looking forward, you might like a more systemised way of working these things out. But I think this committee um, secured a concession which potentially sets a precedent, and that's in... Uh, the papers that you received from the meetings of the Joint Exchequer Committee. Um, there is nothing like that uh, in relation to the Joint Ministerial Committee or any other intergovernmental forum. And it's because that, that committee hasn't met for a couple of years, then clearly that's, that's not altogether satisfactory. But the, the meetings, the, 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 sorry, the minutes of the meetings that you received were actually very frank. I was surprised when I was reading them to see how frank they were. Um, and I think if something, if that can set a precedent for other intergovernmental forums to report to Parliament and allow you to scrutinise those relationships, then that would be a positive thing. Okay, thank you. Just one further point before I let Professor Ed Jeffrey in next. I mean, you also say in your paper that the Calum Commission recommended that uh, a joint ministerial committee finance be established, but this was not pursued. Is that something you believe should be pursued? Um, Possibly. I mean, I think that there's already the... I'm not quite sure why it wasn't pursued, why the government's decided there wasn't a need for it. Um, finance issues come within the Joint Ministerial Committee on Domestic Affairs, um, but maybe as uh, tax devolution intensifies, it might, there might be a case for having a dedicated forum to discuss purely those issues. Um, the downside of that is that... Um, because of the asymmetry and devolution throughout the UK, the Joint Ministerial Committee is for all of the devolved administrations and the UK government, so it, it might not be the most appropriate forum in moving forward. OK, thank you uh, for that. Professor Geoffrey. Uh, thanks. I, I am uh, fully in line with Nicola's comments about uh, the need for more systematic relationships between governments and, and for greater scrutiny um, available to, to parliaments about what governments do. I'd also say I've been saying that for 15 years, um, ever since the, the, the devolution reforms uh, in their first incarnation were implemented. Uh, and I think that uh, academic uh, expertise has contributed to uh, various inquiries of various parliamentary committees at UK, at Scottish, and indeed in Welsh and Northern Irish contexts uh, suggesting this. Now, th this probably speaks a little bit to uh, our failure uh, to have the kinds of impacts that we'd like to with our expertise, but it also says something, I think, about, about the UK state and the, um, the approach that its central institutions have taken to what you might call territorial management, uh, and the UK state has not adapted in that whole period to the realities of devolution. Uh, and that is a more explicit need to think across the various legitimately constituted governments of the UK uh, to find uh, common purpose and to find mutually acceptable arrangements. Uh, and in the absence of that, what we have is uh, a set of uh, ever-evolving bilateral uh, arrangements between UK Scotland, UK Wales, UK uh, Northern Ireland, uh, around which there is no particular uh, system uh, and which has uh, in some a fragmentary tendency uh, and what I pointed to in, in the paper I wrote for, for the committee was the continuation of that tendency with um, parallel reforms underway in Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland or, or under uh, discussion uh, 
Um, and a, a political context at the moment, and, and no doubt for some time to come, which is quite likely to add further ad hoc and bilateral adjustments in the various places to, to that system. Uh, and I think that, that renders the system as a whole increasingly intransparent, but also increasingly difficult to capture in a systematic structure uh, of intergovernmental uh, relations. There, there is a, a syndrome here which uh, no one appears to be able to get a, a grip of. Okay, thank you for that. Dr. Armstrong. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd just like to um, uh, make clear that I stood for a nomination to the Labour Party for Edinburgh South West in January, just so that's known. Since the end of January, I think the hustings were the 30th or 31st, I have no political involvement since then, so just for the record. Really? Yeah, well, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to be clear whether... Um, I have very little to add uh, to what my colleagues have said. Uh, in terms of the machinery, um, I would uh, uh, only point out that the, uh, the sort of classic um, uh, principle of federalism outlined by Walter Oates talks a lot about spillovers. Um, where spillovers are minimised, then it's much easier to um, devolve powers between two such integrated countries, in fact, four such integrated countries, uh, there will be considerable spillovers, which I think uh, uh, supports the need to have as formal a structure as possible to um, measure and make adjustment for those uh, spillovers. Thank you for that. In fact, I'm, I'm going to go into your own uh, submission, uh, Dr. Armstrong, next. Uh, I mean, you, you, you talk a lot about uh, borrowing, uh, and you say that uh, Scotland should be free to borrow under its own name for capital. Uh, markets, uh, but you then go on to talk about, uh, as you just uh, touched on, spillovers, and you say one of the most important and long-lasting spillovers from decentralising fiscal powers is fiscal indiscipline at sub-central government uh, affecting credit worthiness of central government. But is there any evidence that there has been any uh, fiscal indiscipline in, uh, in Scotland? Well, I'd argue, and um, the question is really, uh, in light of the Smith proposals, what would happen? So it's kind of... Um, at the moment, um, a hypothetical question because um, you know the, the amount of revenue powers that are about to be devolved uh, are going to be significantly different to what there's been in the past. So I'm not at all trying to say that there's been indiscipline in the past. I'm merely trying to point out that uh, around the world where powers have been devolved in federal structures, one of the most difficult uh, issues that people have had to deal with, countries have had to deal with, uh, and a recurring problem is this uh, indiscipline because the uh, responsibilities um, uh, and the liability are not fully aligned. Uh, it's much more of a, a summary of what people find from the evidence from countries around the world and over the last 400 years. It's, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, say, supposed to say this is reflective of the past because Scotland hasn't issued any bonds, for example. <laughs> but I think that I, I would say that I think that... Um, I think it's um, lacking in the debate that we've had a lack of real lack of clarity on all sides on this question. I think it really is a very important question, um, and uh, the you know whether that's the command paper, which seems to suggest something different. You could read it both ways. To the Smith Commission, it goes further than the Smith Commission. Um, the <coughs> The paragraph in the Smith Commission is just not clear at all what that's supposed to mean, and yet it's extremely important to find a, a, a lasting and, and appropriate solution. To you, and I quote, the Commission is utterly vague. It on is. That, uh, yeah, I, I, I have no idea. That paragraph seems to be used just about everywhere on all, you know, all by all different um, assemblies, and it's just not clear what it means. Okay. Uh, let's move on. I mean, you, you talk about, um, you know, the, there's... There seems to be an assumption throughout your paper. Um, it's a wee bit gloom and doom, I feel, that uh, Scotland would run into fiscal difficulties. I mean, because there's a lot talking about bailouts. And, but you say that uh, Scotland's share of public debt, approximately £126 billion, would need to be repaid before debt issuance powers are granted. I mean, uh, how, how would that be so, achievable? So it's, that was uh, under full fiscal autonomy. So the idea there was, suppose that all tax revenue... Um, uh, went to the Scottish government, so there'd be no collection of tax revenue from uh, Scotland to the rest of the UK. Then 
the question there becomes, well, suppose that, you know, at some date in the future there was an issue. How would the UK, uh, you know, what would the, UK, the rest of the UK's uh, case of redress be? And since they wouldn't have any claim to any tax revenues, I thought that the uh, paragraph in the Smith Commission that said, well, the UK could always introduce um, a, a new tax to deal with this, I thought that was... Um, highly unlikely to be successful, which is the comment I made about the Boston Tea Party. That would be very, very difficult in those circumstances. But if uh, no tax revenue were to accumulate to the central UK government, then in terms of that negotiation, you'd like to say, so how would the rest of the UK make sure that it would always be protected? And one way would be that uh, there was no tax liability from Scottish taxpayers uh, to the rest of the UK. Would it, not, would it not? Surely, if, if this did actually happen, the debt could be assigned to Scotland and the, and, uh, the interest or whatever paid, but not actually. You can't, you're not seriously expecting Scotland to actually pay that debt to the UK from from, from where? You know, where, where would Scotland find 126 billion overnight? So like this is so. This is the issue of uh, full fiscal autonomy. That if no revenue goes into central government, so that's an ex you know, there's quite a big change to where we are at the moment, which is 90% of revenue going into central government. If zero goes into central government, then uh, I think that the, the way that this would be looked at would be, well, in the extreme, you have to sort of go to the end game and say, what would happen in the worst possible circumstances? What, how would that negotiation work out? So you sort of solve it backwards. And that would be that the, uh, rest the U that the rest of the UK would have no liability to Scottish taxpayers because they'd be getting no revenue from them. And so just an agreement to pay the interest would leave the rest of the UK households um, exposed to the stock of debt from uh, um, uh, that at the moment would be, at the moment is the um, equivalent responsibility of Scottish taxpayers. So... Uh, I accept that that this is, um, you know, these ways that there would be no liability to the rest of the UK in this zero tax revenue going to the rest of the UK government are um, uh, a very big departure from where we are today, but they are the way that it would be ultimate protection for the rest of the UK. Mm. Professor Jeffrey, what's your view on that? Um, when we move into that territory, I step out of my uh, disciplinary expertise. Um, but I, let, let me make a comment, and, and that is that um, the discipline of economics, the, a very fine discipline, uh, Angus, um, often works uh, with uh, very clean uh, assumptions and tries to draw inferences from very clean assumptions. Politics, political science is altogether much grubbier. Uh, in in the way that it that it works, um, <clears throat> uh, and my <clears throat> uh, my my reading of of the situation that Angus describes is that it wouldn't happen in one go. Uh, we've we've heard from uh, from SNP sources that full fisc full financial responsibility, I think we now know it as, uh, would be phased in. Uh, and in a sense, that process is underway with uh, the, the very limited amount of fiscal autonomy established for the Scottish Parliament at the outset being supplemented as the Scotland Act 2012 powers uh, come in with some variation uh, on the, the, the Smith proposals likely to be pursued by whichever party grouping um, controls a majority of seats in the UK Parliament after the next uh, election with a commitment by the SNP in addition to that to press for full financial responsibility uh, on a phasing in basis. Uh, that, that sounds to me like grubby politics uh, at play which wouldn't uh, leave us at the kind of cliff edge uh, yeah. assumption that, that Angus uh, has, has set out there. This would be something negotiated in the context of uh, a changing Scottish fiscal framework amid a changing UK fiscal framework over a period of years. Okay, thank you, Professor McEwen. No, not too much to add also outside of my disciplinary um, comfort zone. 
Um, but to say that, I think it is an illustration of when you increase um, fiscal autonomy or any other kind of autonomy, it does heighten the prospect uh, that Angus referred to at the beginning of those spillover effects um, in both directions, actually. Um, so it, if you have greater responsibilities uh, within Scotland, then <laughs> paradoxically it could make Scotland more vulnerable to the decisions um, taken elsewhere that impinge on those responsibilities and also at the same time heighten the, the potential for Scottish Government decisions to have an impact, uh, to have cross-border effects. Um, so it does, um, I think, reinforce the, the central point I was trying to make is that the more you increase powers within Scotland, the more you need those agreements and institutions in place to manage those spillover effects. And I think um, the transition to whatever set of new powers we were moving to should go hand in hand with agreement on how you manage and coordinate the, 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 the messy edges, the, the spillover effects of that. Okay, thank you. Just, just uh, uh, to go back to full fiscal autonomy a wee bit, I don't want to go too far into that without letting uh, uh, colleagues in, but you, you said also in your paper you know, that if Scotland were to seek uh, full fiscal autonomy in the UK, would have almost no method of address, but surely the UK holds the whip hand on this. I mean, they have control, ultimately. Well, <clears throat> what do you mean by control? Well, I mean, they, they control the, 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 the political and economic levers in terms of the, the UK economy at present, do they not? Uh, for the rest of the UK, so under, as far as I understand full fiscal autonomy, uh, the taxation would be collected in uh, Scotland rather than being redistributed back through a block grant um, with uh, a number of services sort of um, uh, bought in, so to speak, defence, foreign affairs, presumably financial stability. Appreciate that. Sorry, I was just, I was just trying to. I, I probably didn't ask you the question properly. What I'm saying is, do you feel that if full fiscal autonomy comes in, it's irreversible? Because that seems to be the implication of, of what you've said there. And that, that, do you think it's that, that's really what I'm trying to. Maybe we're, we're talking about two different issues here, but that, that, that was the issue I was trying to to to, to get from. That yeah. So, oh, so, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So, if full, full fiscal autonomy happened, do I think that there was a way that the UK could seek redress if it wanted to take back some of those powers? Um, well, not with any certainty, um, and that's kind of the problem that you've got to. How would you uh, start turn around and say, in what would presume be difficult circumstances, that, that this will be, you know, this will be a. a and can I just point out that you know you said that this is uh, gloomy. This is not a forecast, and the point about uh, economics is to um, uh, look at the worst scenarios to make sure they're safeguarded against before they ever happen. You know, if people had done this in Europe, we probably wouldn't have been in these sort of situations of, of poor architecture if we'd taken notice of this at the beginning. So this is in no way supposed to be a forecast. It's supposed to say, well, what are the parameters around this would work? And I think it's better to be hard-headed and clear about these first, but I totally acknowledge that ultimately there will be a political negotiation. Of course there would. I mean, I understand that, but the, the reason I was saying gloomy was because, I mean, the Institute of Fiscal Studies took a, a slightly different view. They said in the 11th of March that uh, full fiscal autonomy would give more freedom to pursue different and perhaps better fiscal policy and undertake the radical, politically challenging reforms that could generate additional growth. There, there are undoubtedly areas where existing UK policy could be improved upon. Is that, would you not accept that? I mean, because there doesn't seem to be any of that in your, your paper. No, in the last... Uh paragraph, I think it says, this paper has not looked at what could be the growth improving sides of the revenue. There, clearly, if you have uh, control of your taxation spending, then there's lots of things you could do, uh, which may or may not make things better or worse. It's, that would be entirely for Scotland to decide, and quite rightly. And we have uh, made it quite clear that Scotland should be free to borrow. We did this. We've done this a number of times. We haven't said they should be constrained. So, uh, because we understand the, the idea is that Scotland has the capacity to manage its own affairs, and that can only, I think, really happen if it does have at least greater capacity to borrow, but I would argue that has capacity to borrow. Okay, thank you. Now, before I open up to colleagues, I want to move on to Professor Jeffrey's paper, because I haven't really touched on, on that. I mean, it's so involved. I always feel as if I'm stealing everyone else's time here when I, sit, when I spend so much time, so I'm, only, I'm trying not to overdo it in terms of each of you, so I'll just uh, focus on uh, one area. I mean, you obviously... Um, I, I, I talking, uh, sorry, uh, you, you obviously, uh, in, in talking about uh, the United Kingdom, um, 
an enduring settlement, or Scotland, the United Kingdom, an enduring settlement, you're saying that it's unlikely to be a reliable guide for Scotland's future fiscal uh, framework, and you point out uh, the reasons uh, for that. I'm just wondering if you can expand on those reasons uh, for the record, and also some of the other kind of issues which you, you, you um, uh, believe could create some kind of um, uh, uh, shifting uh, in what Smith has actually come out with. And also, if you could touch on uh, Barnet, which you say, and I quote, begins to wither on the vine uh, once some of these changes are made. So, if you can. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Scotland's fiscal framework exists within a, within a UK fiscal framework. The, the, the two uh, relate to each other. Um, and you might well say that there are Welsh and Northern Irish ones uh, as well. And quite possibly an emerging English one. Now they're all, they're all moving parts uh, in a system uh, and they're, they're each uh, moving uh, in different ways for different reasons. Um, uh, three of them I, I set out in the paper. Uh, the first is that the, the Smith Commission consensus uh, is no longer uh, a consensus on what was written in that report. Um, uh, I, I mentioned in the paper that uh, uh, John Swinney uh, in a sense moved away from that at the press conference marking the launch saying okay we'll take this but we think there should be in various ways for various reasons more. Uh, the Labour Party also has uh, supplemented in, in a rather vague way <coughs> uh, what it thinks should be uh, in uh, on offer uh, uh, as part of a new uh, a Scotland bill in the field of welfare uh, and the Conservative Party has taken something away uh, which is the uh, the commitment in the Smith Commission report that uh, all UK MPs should be uh, voting on any budget decisions to do with income tax that's uh, that's now gone in the Conservative Party uh, vision as as set out by William Hague in January and reiterated in in an English manifesto, a written version of which I have yet been able uh, to track down. Um, uh, so, so Smith is is a, a moving target in a, in a sense, with with at least three of the signatory parties in different ways um, moving beyond the initial consensus. The the, the point about about Barnet is is a um, uh, is a different one. Uh, Barnet is a, a, a quite fundamental part of the existing framework uh, for um, determining the budgets of the devolved administrations, but it is becoming less important uh, insofar as uh, fiscal autonomy at the devolved level is increased because that means there is a smaller quantum uh, through which Barnet consequentials will uh, flow because part of the fundraising responsibility becomes that of the Scottish Parliament uh, around the Scotland Act 2012, whatever comes out of Smith. Uh, there is a similar uh, process underway in Northern Ireland around corporation tax uh, and similar is envisaged for Wales as the, the Silk Commission proposals on finance move towards uh, legislation. Uh, so, so Barnet becomes uh, a smaller part of the system and uh, the fiscal autonomy which generates own revenues becomes a, a bigger part of the system. There's a very interesting point about, uh, about what, the, what the Conservative Party has uh, suggested uh, in moving beyond Smith. Uh, it has talked about an English rate of income tax. I'm not sure whether that's what it's actually proposing. It, it's probably proposing an English, Welsh and Northern Irish uh, rate of income tax to be determined by uh, a, a group of MPs in the UK Parliament to the exclusion of, uh, of Scottish MPs. Um, but uh, that, whether it's English or English, Welsh and Northern Irish, is, is an interesting uh, issue relative to, to Barnet consequentials because um, the, 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 the package of decision making about what happens in England uh, is what has driven uh, adjustments to devolve budgets through the Barnet process. But if you begin to take England as a distinct unit, uh, not subject to decision-making by all uh, UK MPs, you move into a very different place. Uh, 
um, the Barnet system may make some sense. I'm not a fan of the system at all, but it may make some sense if all UK MPs are making decisions about England in the consciousness that this affects the budgets of the devolved administrations. If you create a separate decision-making space for England, then that rationale um, becomes uh, challenged. If there are English MPs deciding on matters to do with England uh, without the inclusion of, of MPs from the rest of the UK, it kind of undermines the, the, the principles in the system. Uh, we're not there yet, that's, that's speculation, but it is a kind of logical consequence of the way in which the Conservative Party has, has moved. The final uh, moving part is, is simply um, the UK general election. If you were meeting in a month's time, uh, you might be a bit surer uh, of, of where we are. Uh, but there is, um, <coughs> there is speculation and to some extent a price list uh, uh, for the involvement of, uh, of parties representing distinct bits of the UK uh, for their support in helping to establish a UK government of, of, of either uh, colour. Uh, and if we take as an example the, um, the Democratic Unionists in Northern Ireland, to whom the, the price £1 billion per year has been uh, attributed, uh, this would not be a Barnet payment, because to generate an additional £1 billion for Northern Ireland through Barnet would mean uh, an awful lot of extra spending uh, at the UK level. So this would be very explicitly a deal to bypass the current system. Uh, Plaid Cymru in Wales have, have argued for equivalent per capita uh, returns to those uh, received by Scotland under the current system. Again, if you were to generate that through Barnet, that means uh, a very big boost to UK level spending, which would of course feed through to Scotland and maintain the differential. So they mean um, a side payment. Um, uh, for Wales in particular, which would be beyond Barnet. So we could see a system, depending on how the numbers work out, where um, the, the, the current mainstay of the UK's system of territorial arrangements for budget adjustments um, becomes uh, increasingly bypassed. So all sorts of moving parts, um, which uh, renders the, the current situation um, certainly less transparent, more subject to asymmetric relationships between the different parts of the UK, harder to conceive and manage through intergovernmental relations and, and much harder for, for you and your equivalents in the various parliaments of the UK uh, to uh, keep adequate uh, scrutiny oversight over. Okay. Uh, Dr Armstrong, want to comment? Too? Yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, something which Charlie's pointed out, um, uh, you sort of touched on the English votes for English laws issues. Um, this is where the problem of asymmetry of size really raises its head and becomes very difficult to solve. Um, because if one was to go, were to go down that route, just again, hypothetical, because we're not, we don't even know what that would look like, but suppose, then um, <clears throat> you'd have um, the English committee or parliament or whatever it is, making, uh, say, income tax decisions for 85% of the union, um, which would clearly have spillovers to the other parts of the union. And because it's 85%, um, the monetary policy takes into consideration the overall fiscal position of the United Kingdom, 85% of which would be decided by this committee or parliament or whatever it is. But everybody else would have to live with the monetary policy decisions and so actually that's quite undemocratic in many ways. And so that runs into problems as well. As we've pointed out to the Treasury Select Committee, there's real democracy issues around that because of this interaction between fiscal and monetary policy when it's 85%-ish of the whole union. Uh, Professor McKeown, do you want to comment on this? Just briefly, I mean, I, I, I don't think the Smith proposals or their translation into the command paper and the draft clauses was an enduring settlement anyway. Um, I, I think that there were elements in there that would have created new anomalies, which would have meant we would be revis revisiting it before too long anyway. Maybe an example of that would be around the issues of tax powers that we've been discussing. Um, 
if you devolve all of income tax on earned income only, and this parliament chose to raise the higher rate of income tax, it's not beyond the realms of possibility for higher earners to shift their income into unearned um, savings or dividends or to change residence status if that's an option open to them. Now, that would not have been the intention of that power, but it could be one of those unintended consequences. I think there are anomalies all the way through um, that package, um, but I agree with Charlie. Politics is moving on very, very rapidly, um, which makes it uncertain as to what... Um, I think there will be um, a, a Scotland bill. Um, I think there will have to be. Politics also demands something uh, before next year's election, but the contents of that, uh, I think, um, are still unclear. Um, on the issue of an English or, or an English Welsh Northern Ireland income tax, rate of income tax, or English votes for English laws, I mean, I, th I think the one of the implications of that that I don't I haven't seen evidence of being thought through yet is that that would demand a change in the way that the UK government it does its business, not just in terms of finance, but it doesn't think of itself or organise itself on that sort of territorial basis um, for England only or in a jurisdictional way. Um, and that would need to change, I think. That's one of, the, one of the consequences of those changes in parliamentary and legislative procedures that would need a change also in government and the executive. And so I think there's lots of things that are perhaps said in the heat of an election campaign, the details of which remain unclear and the consequences of which remain unclear. OK, thank you very much for that. Now, going up to the session to colleagues around the table. First person um, to ask a question will be Deputy Convener, to be followed by Mark. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, I think probably we're going to be going over uh, similar themes uh, as each of us ask uh, questions. I, I mean, the, the one on transparency, um, which has been touched on already and even the suggestion that, for example, the DUP might ask for about an extra billion. I mean, I mean that's very transparent in a sense. We all see that happening. If, if it's agreed to, you know, that's open. So there's no problem with transparency. I mean, there might be a lack of logic, I suppose, to it. And on the other example, I think Professor McCune, uh, when we were looking at the block grant adjustment, I mean, again, it's been quite transparent. We've done all the studies for two years, and then in 15 minutes they made a decision. And the both sides, I think, have been quite open about that. So that's been quite transparent. Again, it might not be totally logical. So should we really be worried about the transparency issue? Do you want me to? Um, I'll, I'll let Charlie deal with the DUP issue. Um, the point I was trying to make is that that level of transparency that you had after pressing for it, I understand, um, is unusual uh, with respect to intergovernmental leaders. I don't know if any of you have read the annual reports of the Joint Ministerial Committee. They're about a page and a half of very generously spaced text, which barely tell you what was on the agenda of meetings, let alone the substance of the discussions. Um, so I th that's where I think that the, the level of detail that was made available to you uh, in relation to those sorts of discussions maybe should serve a precedent. Um, I understand the sensitivities within government where there needs to be a degree of confidentiality, particularly in advance of meetings. You're not going to maybe publicly declare your hand if it would be damaging or make it more difficult to gain concessions. I understand all of that, but I think that there is a balance to be struck in terms of the degree of transparency about what's coming uh, in those meetings so that Parliament has an opportunity to perhaps input into that, and in particular, uh, in the aftermath of those meetings so that Parliament has an opportunity to scrutinise and to question government on the content of discussions. And that, in all of the other areas of intergovernmental relations, doesn't take place. So, in an ideal world, um, would we... I mean, clearly, there seems to be, from the, all the papers I can see, there's the, the need for a kind of formal structure and there's also the need for good informal relationships. I think that seems to be taken. So... Is the problem at the moment that what we need is we need to have the informal relationship, they come to a kind of broad agreement, then that comes to a structured meeting and there are actually concrete reasons given for why the decision was made and, and we seem to have missed that out at the moment. Would that, would that take us forward, do you think? Partly. I mean, I, th I think if you talk to officials, they would probably suggest that those formal 
ministerial meetings are almost things would only get that far if they couldn't be resolved through the more informal channels. And that's quite normal and quite common uh, in other systems as well. Uh, but I think it's where there are um, politically contentious issues, where there are jurisdictional issues, then I think it's appropriate that Parliament has an opportunity to scrutinise that. And so that's the sorts of things. If it couldn't be dealt with through the informal channels, then it might make it to that sort of forum and maybe you should know about that and know you know if decisions are made know the rationale for coming to a particular conclusion one thing i would say on the joint ministerial committee um and formalization well i think formalization is important it also has to go alongside um a revision to what it's for and a reflection on the purpose of those sorts of forums if they're just regular and institutionalized and they meet to do not very much at all, then it's not really going to be in the interests of any government to invest time and resource in that. So I think if they are focused um, with a clear purpose um, that might mean um, making decisions, which they don't at the moment, they're not executive bodies, um, then I, th I think that would probably be a, a positive thing. But it would require agreement um, from each of the parties on the purpose and their status within it. Um, at the moment, the GMC is, is, has a joint secretariat, but probably functions in a little bit of a hierarchical way, um, which one could see would uh, perhaps be problematic for the devolved governments that were involved. I mean, in the Spice paper, it refers to other countries, and I think some of it was commenting on yourself, so I'm not sure how much, if you're an expert on that area. But, I mean, are there good models out there? Because I get the impression that in Germany and Canada, they're constantly having meetings with each other. I mean, do, 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 are they, do they work or are they just kind of formalities? Do you know? Probably, probably a bit of both. Um, I mean, I, Charlie mentioned earlier about this sort of plethora of bilateral and arrangements between the different governments um, in different bits of the UK that are emerging. But it's still very little compared to most uh, intergovernmental relations in other countries that I'm aware of anyway, where there are many more. Um, forums for discussing these things. Now, some will be more important than others. That might depend on the issue differences between the governments. It might depend on the personalities involved. Um, so I think in there are two things that I think your, your briefing paper does point out that I think are important to bear in mind. One, we are the UK is not a federation. Um, and two, well, three things. Two, it's incredibly asymmetric. And three, this is a multinational state. And I think those things do... Um, affect the dynamic of intergovernmental relations in a way that they don't perhaps in, in the case of Germany that, that you mentioned, maybe a little in Canada. Okay. Sorry, Professor Jeffrey, do you want to Thanks, come in? Uh, I might say something about Germany, but I, I wanted to come back to the DUP point. Um, I, I think there's more to, to transparency than saying this is what we want and that's our price. Um, one might say, well, where did that figure of a billion pounds come from? Uh, where is the the, the evidence-based process which produced that figure? When was it debated in the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly? And I, th I think you'll find that the answers to those questions are, well, it wasn't. It was what we made up because that's what we thought we might be able to get if the numbers turn out that way. I think transparency is, is about predictability. It's about having rules of the game uh, so that uh, scrutiny can be uh, done on a, on a systematic basis. And... It's worth reflecting that the, the Barnett formula was introduced uh, in a sense to produce a, a certain level of stability in the rules of the game, uh, whereas beforehand um, the, the level of funding spent uh, by the UK government in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland depended on the negotiating skills of the Secretary of State for Scotland in discussions with the UK uh, Treasury. <coughs> Uh, and that was felt uh, not to be terribly transparent and not necessarily to be the best basis for, uh, for um, e establishing uh, territorial funding flows. And I think we're, what we're seeing now is, is a, as a calculation about what kind of leverage can come from an election rather than uh, a clearly uh, established rules of, uh, the get set of rules of the game which uh, are amenable to, to debate uh, and scrutiny. Um, is one better than the other? You know, you're saying it used to be just a negotiation and now we've got perhaps a more mechanical system, that word was used with, for a, by a previous witness. 
I mean, I mean is, is one inherently better than the other, or is it just two different ways of doing things? Territorial finance in decentralised states is, is always a mix of the two. Um, there's always calculations of, of power, um, however defined. That can be uh, the economic power that a particular unit has. It can be you know, the outcome of an election, uh, which can temporarily invest uh, power in a, in, a, in, a, in a party which will have at best nine uh, MPs. Um, so that's always going to be part of the process. Um, I, I think there is uh, a concern, uh, given uh, the way that the UK is uh, trying to adapt itself to various pressures for additional decentralisation, uh, that a clearer understanding uh, of, of how uh, territorial finance decisions uh, are made would actually be quite helpful uh, for the stability of the arrangements in each part uh, of the UK and the stability of their uh, operation from year to year. Uh, and that's what rules of the game, broadly agreed principles around which you have a political negotiation uh, deliver. Um, uh, and that's, uh, to go to Germany, that's, that's what you have in spades uh, in, in Germany, um, where, where there is a, a more or less constant process of negotiation between the territorial units and between them collectively and, uh, and the central level. Uh, I, I don't think this is a particular model for the UK because Germany is, is in many senses, a very centralised uh, country which draws the territorial units into government uh, at the centre. Uh, and it, it establishes its rules of the game to a considerable extent in the country's constitution, so at a very high level uh, of, uh, of legal um, status, uh, which I, I think we're um, some way from uh, in a country which uh, is, is unable to write down its constitution in one place. Thank you. Professor Armstrong, did you want to say anything on that? Or? Uh, just simply to point out that the amount of meetings and so on doesn't uh, equal um, transparency. Uh, and opacity and a lack of transparency are necessary conditions for having moral hazard. So moral hazard doesn't happen out of thin air. It's when things are opaque and not clear, that's, that's the necessary condition for moral hazard. That's when you get risk shifting, and that's why you want to get rid of it. By said, and the best way, as Charlie said, is by having the rules set as clearly as possible right at the beginning. Okay, thank you. On your own paper, uh, I mean, you spend quite a lot of time on debt and uh, the relationship of Scottish debt, UK debt. Something that's been brought up to us previously is then the relationship of local government debt. And I just wondered if you see that, is that a factor in that? And would we perhaps need to look at how we deal with local government debt, which largely has, does its own thing under the prudential framework uh, as we move forward? Uh, I actually think there is, um, this is coming for the whole of the UK, uh, an issue with um, having to have much greater oversight over local authority debt, but also local authority off-balance sheet financing, where there certainly was in the past um, considerable leeway for agreements, long-term agreements that were not clear uh, what they were and what the implications um, of them could be had things turned out differently uh, in terms of interest rates over the last 10 years. Um, I understand that most of those have been um, unwound, but it struck me that the only people gaining from these were the investment banks that were advising them. And it wasn't clear at all what the risks were that people, that local authorities were taking on. So I do think there's a broader issue um, that needs to be considered here. I mean, the argument for the prudential framework has been that as long as the individual unit can afford to repay whatever it's committed to, be it straight debt or some other arrangement, eh, that should be OK. But w would you argue that more, the centre should be more kind of worried about the, the various constituent parts? Uh, yes, I would. I mean, you know, you could say that the uh, prudential framework, these are, you know, interesting terms, um, it's, uh, as long as you can pay, but it's only when you can't pay this becomes an issue, obviously. And so we have to work backwards to, well, what would happen if somebody couldn't pay and what would, what would the incentives be for another part of government to have to step in and uh, resolve that? Because responsibility and liability need to be aligned to have um, uh, um, authority and responsible uh, governance. And so having that as clear as possible at the beginning and understanding what would happen if things 
were not to turn out the way that um, a local authority perhaps envisaged, I think that that's very important to establish those rules as clearly as possible. And, and that seems to be the lesson from many of these uh, federal governments that uh, you know there's an ongoing difficulty um, with being clear, partly because of the way that these federations evolve. They're all very different, right? You can see every country's federation has a different structure and different nature to it um, because of their own um, political history. But trying to be as clear as possible about where the liability lies, I think, is um, as an economist, is is a, a first order item. <laughs> So, I mean, if a Scottish local authority got into trouble, I mean, we would have to go in and sort them out, wouldn't we, as the Scottish Parliament? And similarly, if the Scottish Parliament got into trouble, the UK would have to step in. Under current... Well, obviously, these would be your own decisions, but under current arrangements, then uh, I would expect any local authority that got into trouble in the UK, uh, the next level of government, to come in and support it. Not least because, of course, you... Uh, as uh, Hamilton said, you know, you can only, you should only have borrowing powers if you have a means of extinguishing them, of extinguishing the debt. So if you don't actually have any revenue powers, then giving a body borrowing powers uh, is not very prudent because there would be no way that they could actually resolve it themselves if they got into trouble. Full fiscal autonomy, of course, would be very different because all fiscal powers would be awarded to the Scottish government. And I think on this, if I may, just final point, if I may say on, on the... Um, this issue of transparency. It's exactly around this issue of um, uh, of borrowing. You know, w is the intention that a Scottish government f forever runs a balanced budget, apart from the errors, right? So errors is accepted. That, that happens. Forecasting errors happen. But is the intention to always hold a balanced budget? If that is the intention, you you know, that would effectively be saying the last 90 years of economic development that you can smooth shocks um, that would be cast aside and if you then say well uh, actually you are going to be able to have a macroeconomic policy a separate macroeconomic policy well that seems to contradict what the UK have said in the command paper and this is what I mean by a lack of transparency it's, there seems to be no even understanding of what each other's positions are I mean, do you think bringing in some kind of third party into all of that would help? I mean, I think in Australia there's been this talk about the Australian Grant uh, Commonwealth Com Commission, is that what it's called, uh, who seem to be, I don't know, I'm not sure how they're appointed, but they seem to be able to stand outside the government the relationships. Is, is that a good model? Well, as far as I understand, that's what happens when things, uh, which um, uh, provinces need to have uh, additional support. Um, I think that there'd be... The, we're talking very much at the inception stage of how do you set up these rules and the responsibilities and the legislation. I think that's for national parliaments to solve themselves. I think it's for the politicians to solve. The difficulty is it's not clear exactly what each um, area has in mind uh, when it comes to issues like debt. I mean, that, as I said, that paragraph that I've quoted is something that's used quite often. Uh, in various guises, a few words change, but within the overall UK fiscal framework, you know, that's changed. Does okay. it change every time the UK fiscal framework changes? <laughs> okay, good question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the final thing I wanted to kind of touch on was, a, Professor McEwen, you mentioned no detriment, and that's been something that's come up at committee quite a lot. Um, you kind of analyse it, very clearly, in my opinion, as to you know the different kind of levels, we could have a kind of relaxed no detriment or a strict no detriment. I, I mean, are you aware that that has worked in other countries, <laughs> uh, especially the ongoing part, because we've, we've been having conflicting advice or evidence, I think, as to whether on an ongoing basis you can really have no detriment or you can't? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that exactly resembles a, a quite strict interpretation of no detriment as it's set out in the Smith Commission report. Um, and there are, um, and my knowledge is a little bit sketchy, but there are agreements um, in Belgium, for example, I know that um, additional fiscal autonomy uh, went alongside cooperation agreements that would minimise tax competition uh, between the regions within the country. So that's a kind of um, no detriment on an ongoing basis sort of issue. Um, Charlie might have something to say again about Germany because um, there is a kind of solidarity principle in place there but it's more 
akin, I think, to a, a bailing out sort of scenario rather than a no detriment one. Um, but detriment, I mean, I th my knowledge of the, of the countries that I know of, detriment or consequences, spillover effects, if you like, happens routinely. Um, and it's, it's part of the consequences of having multi-level government. Within the European Union, we have uh, an element of control around competition policy, which uh, ought to minimise detriment to some extent. Um, but I, I, I don't know if of anything that would um, go as far as I think, as, my, as I interpreted that second no detriment clause within the Smith Commission um, that would require financial compensation uh, for um, policy decisions that had a detrimental impact. And I cannot for the life of me see how that would be manageable in a way that wasn't highly politically contentious. I, mean, I saw in your, you'd spoken to the House of Lords Committee and you said there's no such thing as watertight compartments. Uh, there will inevitably be spillover effects. So, so do we just have to live with the fact it's going to be a bit untidy? I, th I think you do. I mean, multi-level government is untidy. OK, yes, sorry, Professor Jeffrey. I, I, I just wanted to, um, to, to reflect on an idea which has been uh, put into the election campaign, um, quite possibly uh, without much thought. Um, it, was, it was very big in the Cumberland News uh, recently. Uh, I've, got, I've got, the, got the press clipping here, and, and you know, there's, there's all sorts of local papers in Cumberland which were very full of it. Uh, and that's, that's the, the so-called Carlisle principle that the Prime Minister uh, set out, uh, I think, on the 21st uh, of April, which is a, a very interesting idea um, uh, in which uh, a Conservative government after May would conduct an annual review of the impact of the Scottish government's policies, including overtaxation, to assess if they're having an adverse impact on other parts of the UK. This is about making sure we understand the impact that devolution is having and make sure that the rest of the country never unwittingly loses out. Um, I, I, I had a bit of an exchange with, with Nicola about this beforehand and unbeknown <coughs> to each other, I had coined the Gretna principle and, and Nicola had coined the Dumfries uh, principle. <laughs> uh, because there's, there's something a bit asymmetric uh, there in the assumptions <laughs> underlying uh, that uh, and the, the asymmetry is the absence of consideration of a decision uh, taken by the UK government, which might have a detrimental impact on uh, on Scotland. Uh, and who would be the the body set up to uh, to uh, have a look at that uh, alongside the the annual review of the impact of Scotland on the rest of the UK? I think that points a little bit towards. Um, a possible need for an independent arbiter, or at least an arb arm's length uh, arbiter, or a capacity for analysis which is not driven uh, by a central government which can act as, uh, as judge and jury uh, on a matter without being subject to the same accountability requirements for its own decisions for their spillover impacts. I think that points to the, to the, to the real difficulty which Nicola has, 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 has emphasised in enacting that um, ongoing detriment uh, principle. It's, it's, it's a very, very strange uh, kind of understanding which doesn't have uh, many equivalents elsewhere except in ongoing intergovernmental relationships uh, insofar as they are institutionalised in other places which clearly do look at those spillover effects but if you don't have those ongoing intergovernmental relationships organised in a systematic way you cannot have that mutuality, which I think is needed uh, in understanding the spillovers between different jurisdictions. Okay, Dr. Armstrong. Yeah, can I just uh, come in, this uh, no detrimental uh, phrase? I mean, it's I find it extraordinary as an economist. I mean, it sounds like a lawyer's phrase, um, and you know, while I think having an independent panel of experts might be the best of a bad way to try and estimate this, uh, the idea that it's economically can be estimated. I think is um, very optimistic. My, the point I'd like to make is that the uh, consequences here for Scotland seem to be much bigger than for the rest of the UK. So, for example, if you take trade between Scotland and the rest of the UK, it's, the sterling amount is obviously exactly the same as trade the other way because it just goes across the same border. But because Scotland's 8.5% uh, uh, of the UK, uh, 
total trade between Scotland and the rest of the UK as a share of Scotland's GDP is worth about 70%. So any change in that has a huge impact on Scotland. The other way around, it's seven. So a one percentage point change from Scottish policy, whether good or bad, has a fairly small effect on the rest of the UK. One percentage point change from the rest of the UK policy, whether good or bad, has an enormous effect on Scotland. And so again, this asymmetry plays, which is very important to get right. Um, uh, and that's in a sense why, bizarrely enough, you'd almost want to have more controls over the rest of the UK than you want to have on Scotland. You know, although everybody thinks it should be the other way around, it's actually the, it's, it's the rest of the UK that could really make life difficult through its good or bad decisions or then the other way around. Well, that's a fair point. Did you want to come back in, Professor McEwen? Just... Um, my re- There's not much detail on the Carlyle principle, but my reading of it is, is perhaps a little bit different, and it's alongside the interventions of George Osborne that I cited in the paper to the Treasury Select Committee, um, where he seemed to interpret no detriment as meaning that if there was a detrimental impact, say, in the north of England, then it would be the UK government's responsibility to intervene to manage that. And the Carlyle principle could be read in that way as a commitment by the Conservatives made in an election campaign to the north of England to say, if there's a detrimental impact, we will step in to try to address it. Um, What's not clear is if um, that evidence of detriment would then lead on to some sort of intergovernmental agreement or expectation that the Scottish Government would step in too uh, to, to try to alleviate that detrimental impact. I mean, I think that's, that's an altogether different proposition and much more problematic, and of course one that would have to work in the reverse situation as well, and which is equally problematic. I spend all day on this, but I think that, that's great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. So having had the convener and deputy convener hoover up most of the questions that I had anticipated asking, this will probably be quite brief. But just on the no detriment stuff, maybe a little bit further on that. I mean, my my understanding at the beginning of this whole process was that the no detriment was intended to apply simply at the point of which powers were transferred. and appears to have grown into other definitions, and there appear to be three or four different interpretations that are now in play depending on who you're asking and, and when you're asking them. So I just wonder how, how far it, how far forward is no detriment intended in your understanding to apply uh, in terms of how policies are then enacted? Because you know you, you could be you know 20 years into the future and still applying a no detriment principle. And how does that actually take effect? Well, within the Smith Commission report, there are um, set out different. Uh, different no detrimental effects, if you like. So there is the first that you mentioned at the point of devolution, um, so that neither government should be uh, any better off or worse off as a result of that transfer of powers, whether it's revenue raising powers or spending powers. And that's that's not necessarily easy, as you've seen in the case of block grant adjustment debates, but it's doable, I think. But the Smith Commission report also uh, stipulates two other uh, areas of no detriment Uh, The first is to say that when changes in tax in the rest of the UK, um, for which responsibility has been devolved, should only affect public spending in the rest of the UK, and that's in relation to the taxes issues that we've already been discussing. And the second is that when either government makes policy decisions that affect the tax receipts or spending of the other, the decision-making government will either reimburse if there's an additional cost, or receive a transfer if there is a saving. So that is about ongoing policy decisions. Now, uh, George Osborne's interpretation of it didn't seem to go that far. Um, My hunch is that because this is so difficult uh, to give effect to, that it might not actually transpire into any agreements and arrangements. Um, otherwise I don't really see the, the only way it would operate is if it was a disincentive to diverge at all um, and I don't see uh, the Scottish Government of whichever party um, doing nothing with its new powers so. I mean, pr- pr- Presumably in essence what you've described is essentially a, co- a kind of long term maintenance of an st- effective status quo arrangement where any change that is made that uh, and then I guess the question is, how do you then measure uh, 
the the impact of that policy? Is there is there an easy way that you could say, for example, if we took a decision in Scotland around, for example, the income tax rate, uh, is there an easy way to measure whether that has a detrimental impact in another part of the UK? I mean, it could, you know, the, the, you you mentioned the Carlyle principle, but you know, it's probably equally the Cardiff principle as well. And, and how do you measure those impacts? I think it's extraordinarily difficult to to <coughs> measure cause and effect in that way because there will be, uh, for any development, whether it's in Scotland or whether it's in the rest of the UK, there will be multiple drivers, multiple causes uh, that have led to either you know a fall in revenue or a decrease in jobs or an increase in jobs or whatever it is. Um, think of it in terms of, of Scotland's um, new competences, say, in, in welfare, in social security. Um, if the UK economy um, changes in such a way as a result of UK government decisions that increases um, a welfare burden within Scotland, uh, does that mean that Scotland gains additional compensation as a result of that? I mean, you can, it's very, very difficult to establish cause and effect in these cases, which is why I think it's, it's deeply problematic. Of course, one could flip it the other way and say that there may be decisions which are taken in either scenario which could result in a disproportionate benefit as opposed to detriment. And I guess, how is that then? Would that then simply apply in terms of, well, if, if somebody gets a disproportionate benefit, that counts as a detriment to the other part of the UK? Good question. Um, I mean, I, th I think the, the intention is that if they make policy decisions that produce benefits, that they should um, secure the savings from those benefits. But again, that's very difficult to measure and assess. I don't know if Dr Armstrong or Professor Jeffrey want to chime in at this point or anything. Just one comment again, uh, and, and I think it points to the need to have those effective, ongoing, intergovernmental relationships. I think Angus was right. This was a kind of loyally phrase which was, was bunged into Smith as a means of getting an agreement at that moment um, and may have been necessary to get agreement at that moment. Uh, how it works in practice is, a, is an entirely different matter and I, and I suspect that the, the most straightforward way of operating something like that in practice is, is simply to make sure that the, the governments talk to each other, that they're aware of each other's plans and talk about the spillover effects of those plans. Um, one example, there, there is much, much discussion of um, the, the, the full fiscal autonomy that the Basque country and Navarra in Spain for all sorts of historical reasons, uh, enjoy. Um, but it's not really a full fiscal autonomy because there are discussions with the Spanish central government, uh, especially around tax competition, which lead to agreements uh, between the two about what, what each will do. That doesn't undermine the principle of full fiscal autonomy. It, it just suggests that the practice uh, is a negotiated uh, practice. Uh, and, and I suspect um, rather than you know, the notion of the, the UK government providing an authoritative report every year, uh, I, I suspect actually what you get is a discussion between governments uh, about the consequences of each other's actions across uh, the, the relevant borders and some kind <coughs> of mitigation of some of those actions if both sides agree, yep, yeah, that's, that's a problem, we better do something about it. Mm. <clears throat> uh, just to point out that it seems to contradict the sort of logic of having federalism in the first place, which is actually a central government can't possibly know all the preferences and needs and information at a local level. That's the whole point of doing it. Then you have uh, greater devolved powers and say, but we can't, we need to delegate to a greater judge who can work out what all this information is and exactly how to compensate either side. Now, that contradicts it. It's, it's assuming a level of information we just don't have. And so I agree that the, some sort of um, broader discussion about what could be the consequence of some of these po policies uh, on both sides of the border or whichever borders uh, is the most you know, reasonable way to, to approach this. Well, one of the points that's been raised in the past, Professor Heald has raised it quite prominently, is around the concept of tax gaming, um, <coughs> particularly focusing on the Treasury, who obviously will have a much broader range of tax levers available to them 
even after the, the Smith Commission takes effect. Um, it was also raised by, I think it was Isabel Dinverno of the Law Society, that perhaps what was required was some kind of fair play clause or agreement which would ensure that that kind of approach wasn't taken. Is that something that you think would would broadly fit within the, the concept of no detriment and is something that could be easily applied? Just to first, yeah, um, I don't know about a fair play agreement. I mean, as economists, I, we, we sort of assume that, that people and governments act in their own interests. So um, I, I, I find those uh, notions difficult, but I do accept the premise which is that tax competition can, from either side of the border, can have very serious implications. Again, I point out that, you know, uh, if the ten top top tax earners walked out of Scotland and the ten walked out of England, the impact on Scotland would be much greater proportionally uh, than in England. I mean, these are, the, 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 these issues are, 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 are potentially very serious. But how to get around that? I, I can only assume that a discussion beforehand um, of <coughs> What would be the possible consequences? Does this look like gaming? What you want to try and avoid is deliberate gaming. I, I, I hesitate to step onto the, the turf of economists about, about acting rationally in, in your own interests. Um, um, but you, you've said also, Angus, that, that a central government cannot know all of the preferences. The information situation isn't good enough. Uh, and that's where I come back to predictability and, and rules of the game, because it can be in one's interests in a, a multiple play game uh, which thinking about um, uh, fiscal policy between jurisdictions over a period of years would be uh, to have some kind of, of regularity of understandings um, so I suspect that uh, something like that may well emerge uh, through the process of discussion in uh, as we enter the situations which uh, legislation is now uh, bringing to us. Um, in other words, pragmatic politics would would provide a lot of the buffering for the um, the, the, the more theoretical economic problem uh, analysis might uh, might suggest. Uh, sorry, okay. Professor McEwen, nothing. I'm sorry, Doctor. So just uh, I mean on um, regular tax policy, then I agree because it's a repeated game. You know, if if one party behaves badly, then there's a, uh, presumably you'd have to have a way of punishment then in order to correct that. But in a repeated game, it's much easier to, easier. It, one could more reasonably see how this would, be a, uh, this would resolve itself into a pragmatic solution that would satisfy people. It's the non-repeated game issues, such as debt, where it becomes problematic because it's not a repeated game. It tends to happen very, very infrequently. And when it does happen, people stop being friends. And in terms of, uh, just to move on to the Barnett formula, and um, obviously there has been uh, much discussion around Barnett uh, of late, as, as one would expect, given the, given the, uh, the election campaign that is ongoing. Um, and there's been talk about, obviously, guaranteeing of, of, of Barnett going forward. But I'm interested, within your, your own paper, Professor Jeffrey, you talk about the, the emergence of pork barrel politics, which are a phrase I, I quite enjoy, but uh, obviously talking about the, the demands from, for example, the DUP around additional funding for Northern Ireland, the, the Plaid Cymru um, in Wales, which I think is them looking at a per head of population parity. Um, how easy, assuming, you know, let, using the old crystal ball and, and, and looking into the future and imagining that either of those parties is, is successful in in gaining those those demands, how easy or otherwise is it then to continue with the Barnett formula if those uplifts take place? It's easy enough to continue using the Barnett formula um, in the regular process. That is, the UK government makes spending decisions uh, in England on uh, areas that are comparable to those devolved, and you apply the population key and. Uh, and that adjusts devolve, adjust devolved budgets accordingly. Uh, the effect of, of, a, of a, um, a side payment uh, to, to Northern Ireland would be to render the Barnet element of funding in Northern Ireland less significant and the directly negotiated element more significant. So, that, so th those payments would essentially be in isolation to 
for their calculations as opposed to having a, a material impact on those calculations would be your understanding well it, it, except that i guess if you if you if you have to pay five billion to Northern Ireland and six billion to Wales over the length of a parliament, that means, in principle, there are, there's less funding available to spend on the comparable programmes in England, which generate the Barnet effects. Although that's a relatively small proportion of the overall budget. Okay. Um, and then also, obviously, there is the, uh, as the Smith Commission takes effect, there's a disaggregation of elements of revenue raising power, which obviously would be the kind of powers that would give rise to Barnet consequential impacts. Uh, d does that again impact on, on how the Barnet formula will, will work going forward? I mean, I know there will still be an element of block grant that will need to be calculated, but given that elements of revenue raising for public expenditure will have been disaggregated, does that have a material impact on how Barnet could, could continue in its current form? I don't know if you want to take that first, Professor Jeffrey, or... Um, very happy to. I, I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm just going back to the Cumberland News uh, and uh, finding the Prime Minister's <laughs> comments. Uh, uh, this is not about reopening discussion about the Barnet formula. Um, uh, and uh, the, the other... Um, well, the, the Scottish player with a, a particularly strong stake in this game is, is the SNP, which in its manifesto has said that it anticipates the continuing operation of, of Barnet. Um, the, the point is that the amount of money that Barnet consequentials would deliver will reduce uh, in proportion to the additional fiscal autonomy uh, allocated to the Scottish uh, Parliament. Um, and so if, if we managed in a, you know, a phased process to get to 90% fiscal autonomy, there'd be a, a really small bit of Barnet consequential left, but it still could be um, the Barnet system operating as is, just with a smaller quantum. Okay. Uh, lastly, um, obviously we're discussing the fiscal framework uh, at this committee, but there is obviously an interaction with the policy framework in terms of how fiscal powers will be used to fund policy priorities. Do you see within the package of powers, and this is open, when we go from Professor McEwen along on this one, um, do you see from the package of powers that are envisaged within Smith that there is a cohesion and a coherence between the fiscal powers that are going to come to Scotland and how those powers could give effect to policy priorities in areas, for example, like welfare? Um, I mean, I think that the important issue around um, welfare responsibilities is that that won't be funded through the Barnett formula. So there will have to be another way um, of transferring the additional revenue and calculating it because of the way that Social Security is financed. It's demand-led finance. Um, so it doesn't go through that... Um, <clears throat> departmental expenditure limit system um, and I think that that's one of the issues that's under discussion at the moment um, within the new ministerial forum um, on welfare that has been established is how you manage that transition and I think one of the reasons one of one of the rationales underpinning um, the identification of social security benefits around disability benefits and carers benefits is that those are expenditures that are relatively stable um, they're depending on policy decisions that change that but they're not um, susceptible to economic cycle effects in the same way um, that uh, those benefits um, are <clears throat> that will merge into universal credit um, will be uh, subject to those sorts of cyclical effects um, so in that sense, then there, there's a rationale, there's a clear rationale for um, limiting um, the social security powers to around the, the, those stable areas, which should make it easier to identify a way to um, facilitate a transfer of, transfer of additional financial resources to meet those needs. But of course, if you look at it in a different way, then clearly there are knock-on effects between those areas of devolved uh, welfare policy and areas which would remain reserved, um, which, uh, leaving aside the financial issue, creates other um, 
anomalies, other potential difficulties in managing that overlap. Okay. Professor Jeffrey? Um, I, I, I don't have anything to add except that um, and I think the assumption is that you have a one-off adjustment of Barnet, um, which is negotiated, uh, sorry, of the block grant, uh, which is negotiated, which would um, again shift the quantum in the other direction to the one I just pointed to, which would then be subject uh, to Barnet consequentials. Am I right? Um, I'm not sure that it's clear yet. Okay. Armstrong. So um, <clears throat> the uh, quote that was brought up at the beginning about um, uh, the finance minister's what's it, two hour uh, multi year was it discussion about um, uh, the Barnet and then it sold in 15 minutes. Yeah, I have you know I can kind of understand because the more you look at this thing. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in it. Um, my only point to make is that trading off uh, tax revenue powers against the block grant, uh, that sort of assumes it's just a zero-sum game, that you know you can you get £10 here, you can reduce £10 here. Actually, uh, you're, it also, the, the current formula is a way of risk-sharing. So tax revenues can be very volatile, up and down, uh, and you get a degree of certainty at least from transferring the revenues and getting the block grant equivalent. Um, so there's a t the uh, risk sharing element that also has to be considered. And then the types of revenue that um, uh, remain in Scotland, how those types of revenue move together. So you, in theory, you want to avoid it where you're left with a very volatile income stream. Uh, not least because that makes budgeting much more difficult. And then you get back to the question of, well, what happens when there's a shortfall? And there you could say, well, there's this uh, exception in for errors, but actually knowing what an error is and knowing when it's the beginning of a cyclical trend or even a structural trend because of declining uh, demographics or, or whatever, uh, they're much, more hard, much harder to observe in reality. So that's the sort of thing that the OBR strains over. What is, is this a structural or cyclical element, or is it just a forecasting error? They're, they're not that obvious in real time. So all of which is to say that there's not just a simple zero-sum game. It's actually quite a complicated issue. So that's why I can understand why it could have taken a lot longer. Um, and so I think that there, are, there is more to it than just simply um, a trade-off of one-to-one. -one. To get this right, for you know, for, for 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 to make sure that it's it supports the welfare on both sides of the transaction, which is surely what the objective is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Gavin, to be followed by Malcolm. Kevin, thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, okay, new issue then. What do you think should be the role and remit of an enhanced Scottish Fiscal Commission? Um, firstly, with the Smith powers, and then secondly, if there are greater powers. Um, how would you see that fiscal commission shaping up? Very, very briefly, um, the, the, the commission was set up with um, some controversy about who was on it and probably too little controversy about the resourcing given to it, uh, which is very slight uh, in terms of its capacity for independent uh, analysis. Uh, and as far as I can see from the, the published papers, it has a budget of £20,000, um, which if you want to do uh, serious arm's length analysis, uh, which uh, informs uh, a debate and is used to help um, uh, hold decision makers to account, is clearly not enough. Okay. Anything to add, Professor? I, mean, I, I haven't given it much thought at the sure, moment, okay. but I'll maybe come back to you. Okay. Dr. Armstrong? Uh, I think that... On one hand, you would like uh, you'd say, well, you know, this is UK debt under these current uh, proposals, you know, the Smith proposal and so on. Uh, therefore, the OBR has to be able to make judgments on that. That's kind of its role to say, are you meeting your fiscal framework or not? That's ultimately it's it's uh, what it's trying to do. Having said that, there is also uh, in coming to that judgment, there's a lot of informal discussion between the OBR and government about potential policies, whether this would be within the rules and, and what the implications would be. So there's a, a dialogue. And I think a, 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 a Scottish fiscal watchdog would want to have a separate dialogue with the Scottish government. And so I don't think it'd be reasonable to expect an OBR to have a dialogue with both 
governments and then say, well, we can somehow guarantee that there's a Chinese wall here, um, which is all at times adhered to. I think that would lack credibility to the outside. So that's why I'm in favor that it would make sense to have two um, uh, in order to have those sort of dialogues. And obviously, I, I mean, I think you know, if that figure is correct, that's the, the things that are most important are that um, location should be outside of government. Uh, they have to have people that are reputed to be of uh, uh, independence. Um, uh, and it needs to be properly staffed. You know, again, if you're going to have forecasts and you want to have reasonable forecasts, it's, it goes to sense, it goes to reason that you have to have proper um, resourcing of it. Okay. And Dr. Armstrong, do you think, it, on the sort of narrow question, do you think that fiscal commission, whatever you want to call them, should they be responsible for producing the forecasts or should they simply comment on the forecasts that are produced by government? So they have to make a judgment on whether the uh, the governments, any governments in this case, uh, policies are going to be within whatever rules that it sets down, fiscal rules. In order to do that, it has to be able to make its own forecast. Okay, thank you. Otherwise, you, you know, the, the government will make a forecast that shows that the rules are met. Yeah which undermines the whole point. So they'd have to make the forecast uh, on behalf of, not behalf, they'd have to make the phone call, their, their, their forecast completely independently of what is their best judgment uh, going to be the path of the economy and therefore the fiscal, whether the fiscal mandate is met or not. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on then, I mean, we are moving back to another issue. Intergovernmental machinery has been discussed, uh, particularly by P Professor McEwen and uh, Professor Jeffrey. Um, you basically said it needs to be more formal uh, than it currently is, and Professor Jeffrey said the German example probably isn't one for us to follow. Just taking that a stage further then, I mean, it, other than saying it should be more formal, are there any kind of other principles that must be out there in their view? And if Germany is not a good ex one for us to follow, are there any international examples that would be um, either directly relevant for us to follow or at least elements within uh, those examples that we ought to be really thinking carefully about? It's not just about the formality. I mean, there is, I suppose, an element of formality in that there is, you know, two, twice a year they will meet in the context of Joint Ministerial Committee. Um, it's, it's a little bit ad hoc in terms of the timetabling of that. But if you have, if, if you have that timetable, then it's much easier for um, parliaments to scrutinise it. Um, and I think that's one other principle is around transparency that we've already talked a lot about. Um, there is an ongoing discussion um, within the Joint Secretariat of the Joint Ministerial Committee about its role and remit. Um, so I think it's perhaps time to revisit its purpose uh, and remit um, to see if it is still fit for purpose as we move forward into a new complex situation. And I, don't, I, I don't think it necessarily is. Um, so it's maybe thinking about what it's for um, and should it be about making decisions which would ultimately then have to go back to the respective governments and the respective parliaments um, to sanction. But um, is that what we think is an appropriate role for a joint ministerial committee? And that it may not be. You know, it may be that, that decision making is properly, um, properly takes place within parliament rather than within a closed door uh, intergovernmental forum, but I think we, it, it's time to now revisit uh, its central function. Um, there, I mean, there will be um, examples from other places that we can look to um, to see how um, interministerial or intergovernmental conferences take place around particular issues, some positive, some negative. But I think because of the peculiarities of the UK system, um, it's highly asymmetric nature. I think it's always going to be difficult uh, to transpose something from another context into the UK. So my hunch is that we'll have to find, yes, take inspiration from us, but have to find solutions internally. Sure, okay. Can I just point to, to one thing which no other place has, um, uh, and that is um, a, a situation in which the statewide government... Uh, in intergovernmental negotiations is also the representative and advocate of the biggest territorial unit of the state. Uh, and and, I, and I, I think this is a, 
a problematic feature of, of UK uh, arrangements as, uh, as they stand. Uh, and we may, we may be at the starting point of a process of institutionalising England in some form. Uh, it, it clearly depends on, on the election outcome uh, we have. Um, but uh, both the Conservatives with their plans on English votes and English laws and the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats as the, the other main parties represented in, uh, in England uh, have also set out prospects of, of some kind of constitutional process to think about England. Um, I, I think that process of disaggregating England from the, the UK government is, is tremendously important and in, in some senses a, a, a prerequisite for a system to function UK-wide uh, in a, a more satisfactory way. Can I just add yeah, sure. one sure. uh, so First of all, going back to the uh, fiscal um, uh, watchdog, there, so the, the watchdog needs to make the forecast, but it's an interesting question then, what happens if the OBR had a different forecast compared to the watchdog? Um, so to a certain extent, perhaps you want to have a, those two watchdogs need to have a dialogue between each other and as far as possible come to an agreement. And perhaps you even want to go further and say there should be, there has to be an agreement, whereas the fiscal watchdog in Scotland is responsible for discussing with government the revenue and um, so on, spending implications of the policies they're having so they can do that in isolation and then that information is fed in, whereas the forecast, I think, maybe it should just be uh, a single forecast. Grateful, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. I won't go over um, all the territory we've covered, but if I could just ask for a clarification of three issues. First, from Dr. Armstrong, you, 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 you are and have been supportive of the Scottish Government being free to borrow under its own name in the capital markets, but, but also you say that it's, it's difficult to um, um, make a, a no bailout commitment. So, I mean, obviously your paper goes as far as full fiscal autonomy, but if we can just pull it back to Smith or some, something like Smith, which is what we'll get, no doubt. Um, so what would your position be on borrowing under Smith? Are you, are, you, are you saying, yes, Scotland should have the freedom to borrow and you just have to accept um, that, there can't, that, that there's no, you can't make a no bailout commitment? Or, or how do you resolve those seeming tensions and contradictions? Are you completely correct? that there, there are contradictions and you go into the, you know, there was, in that little diagram, you go into the cell where it's mixed. Um, uh, you have much less vertical uh, fiscal imbalance, but you still have the outstanding debt issues and the uh, implicit uh, reasons why uh, support would be forthcoming. So you're entirely correct there. I think that that's a matter for um, negotiation. I think the most important thing is that you can never rule out um, support and therefore you're always, in, always inviting a degree of moral hazard. That's just been what we've identified around the world. It happens in many countries. Um, the question is, to what extent could you reasonably, uh, under the sort of Smith package, go to uh, um, make sure that capital markets borrowing is seen, to the extent that it can be, to be properly under um, uh, the Scottish Government's name? And there's a number of measures. One is such as the risk weights that you would put on uh, banks holding uh, of Scottish debt. Um, what you would say in terms of legislation about this, but of course legislations could be always be rewritten. Um, but there's a, those are two areas where I think that you could at least indicate that this is supposed to be properly priced as... as would there be a limit imposed on how much borrowing could take place? Or would you? Um, well, this is an interesting question. My... My uh, view is that that it should not. That actually that undermines the freedom and the responsibility. That you know, uh, when you have a um, a small degree of vertical fiscal imbalance, which it would be under Smith, most countries that are in that situation, whether it's Canada, Switzerland, the U.S., they don't actually impose on their subcentral governments these sort of rules. You know, they allow them to make their own decisions. And of course, given that they have the tax powers they can make their own decisions. And that's exactly what responsibility is about. Okay, moving on to the second area of, of, of Barnett. Um, Professor Jeffrey, you say 
uh, it appears that the SNP envisages the increase flowing as conventional barrack consequence, although it is not clear how far this takes into account of the further reductions and consequential effects that any Smith powers extending um, beyond those of the 2012 Scotland Act would bring. But, but I mean, in terms of the block grant adjustment, I mean, d d does the fact that there um, would there actually be any consequential effects in terms of the overall amount? I mean, is the block grant adjustment not supposed to take account of that? So the, the, the net effect um, is the same. I mean, it, it's certainly under the kind of Smith proposal. So, you know, it's assumed that the tax will raise a certain amount of money. And then, so the tax, the, on the assumption of no, ch no change in policy within Scotland, the tax take and the consequentials um, and the block grant adjustments still make the same amount as, as, as it would have done previously? Well, I, I think we, we um, are still awaiting um, Mr. Swinney's phone call to, uh, to establish uh, precisely what the adjustment in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax uh, will be. Uh, I don't think we've yet seen that. Um, um, but the Smith's uh, proposals suggest that at that moment, there should be no detriment on either side. So, so I think what you have suggested is, is about right. But that doesn't mean uh, stasis. It doesn't mean uh, that there would not be change going forward. And I think um, it, it's, it's also clear uh, in the draft bill, I think more explicitly than, than Smith's, uh, that there should be an incentive effect um, for the Scottish decision maker in using uh, 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 additional tax powers, so that, that if this, um, through through the the genius of the decision maker, produces uh, additional funding relative to that generated in other parts of the UK, then it, it should be retained by the Scottish Parliament, and the the converse as well. Uh, that that if if the uh, the Parliament messes it up, then you have to bear the consequences. So I think you're right at, at day one, but you're not right at, at year two, as, as it were. And then just the, the only other point on Barnet is your DUP example, but presumably you could just have a one-off feed of an increase into the baseline and then Barnet could continue as before, no? Um, it depends what you, what you understand as Barnet, I guess. Um, I think most of us are thinking about Barnet as the adjustment process year on year which is driven uh, in different ways for the various devolved administrations by population relatives to England in respect of comparable areas of, uh, of spending. Um, yes, you could bump up the baseline, but that kind of undermines the, um, the population rationale uh, of the formula. So I, I think it does undermine the, the, the principles on which uh, Barnet is based. I'm just imagining that's what they would do because I mean you, you, that would be a one-off adjustment and then it would be population-based thereafter. So I mean, hopefully it will not arise, but that's me making a political point in terms of the DUP and their part, the prospective partners. But finally, um, well, back to the same scenario, I suppose. Um, since I don't read, read the Cumberland News, I mean, when I did hear about the Carlyle principle, I assumed that this was a kind of hard interpretation of no detriment in contradiction to George Osborne's soft interpretation, but. And, and Nicola McCune, you were suggesting that that's not really clear. It could be open to either interpretation. I think it could be open to either interpretation. Uh -huh. It just depends on, you know, if in that annual review they establish that there has been a detrimental impact by whatever process, where does the responsibility lie for addressing it? And I think that that's still not altogether clear. And I read it differently, I guess. That I, I read it more as the responsibility the UK government assuming responsibility, the Conservatives assuming responsibility to step in, but perhaps that's an optimistic well, I, interpretation. I, I read it in the opposite way, but perhaps that's just in the context. But, but it's not clear. I mean, I think that's, yeah. It's the, the, I mean, the, the issue is it's, it's unclear right, right now. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Jean. It's a very, very interesting discussion. I've enjoyed all of that. Um, I'm slightly obsessed with the, uh, with the no detriment clause, and it occurs to me that or, or, what, what would you think to the notion that we would have to have some kind of assessment as to the detriment that exists? You mean an independent assessment? Mm. Because how can you, you know, that I, I might want to cite a few things that I consider currently that Scotland actually has detriment. And I think that 
am I not right also in thinking that in the Barnet formula, I mean, you know, very keen to talk about how much money Scotland gets in the Barnet formula, but there was an equation, and, it, and although it, it perhaps it wasn't seen by Barnet as the as the be all and end all and something that should have lasted this long and all of that, it was actually taking into th consideration things like the geography of Scotland and rurality and islands and travel and transport and ferries and all sorts of other things. So I, I just think that the, that the the detriment clause can't actually... You, uh, I find it difficult to consider how you might come in at some other level now on any change that might be uh, considered by a Scottish uh, government, parliament, um, without actually the, the whole history of, of where these two or four nations sit together. On, on the... the Barnet point um, and the issue of geography, um, th that has been used as a justification for the proportionately higher per head of population expenditure on identifiable public expenditure that we see in Scotland. Um, but I think that's been a result of lobbying over the decades um, to maintain that differential. Barnet doesn't doesn't do that. Barnett's not explicitly not a needs-based formula, though it's often described as such, uh, but it's not. Um, so I think if you did want a needs-based um, scenario, then you have to you have to re replace Barnett with something else, and then you run into the issues of the politics of need and which needs do we talk about and which needs are deemed more important than than others. Um, on the issue of establishing detriment, I mean, my understanding. Um, from the Smith report is that detriment as a result of policy decisions would be linked to those new powers that would be part of the, the Scotland bill, forthcoming Scotland bill. Um, but I think you raise a really important issue as to who would be the arbiter of, of that. Um, would it be by um, intergovernmental consensus um, or would it be some sort of independent assessment? And then you come into the difficulty of having an assessor that could be mutually respected and acceptable to the different governments in different parts of the UK, and that's, that's extremely problematic, it seems to me. Thank you. Um, my, my other just very small point is that would you consider the the change to stamp duty made and, uh, in the autumn statement by George Osborne to be gaming. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't, I, I don't no, I'm not, I'm not going to say yes or no to that, but I think it is an illustration of um, the need for coordination over the timing of budget statements, and there is a, a mismatch between... Um, the budget cycle um, within that the UK government operates on and the, the Scottish government operates on, which heightens the possibility that, call it gaming if you want, or that there will be um, consequences and knock-on effects from decisions made at one level into another. You could also call it policy learning, if you like. Um, so it's a, it's a different way of, of looking at it, but you will have that as well. And I think there is an issue of... The, the timing and the sequencing um, of the budget process in the different governments that will become increasingly more important. Can I, can I just add on that? When, when George Osborne was making that uh, uh, announcement, uh, I happened to be in a, um, uh, a meeting in London uh, sharing a platform with uh, a senior civil servant from the Scottish Government and a senior civil servant from the UK Government. And the senior civil servant from the UK Government said as we were... Um, following this on our on our phones and on, and on Twitter and so on, um, something in there you're not going to like very much, um, uh, and and I think that was uh, th th there was probably an element of mischievousness in there in the recognition that this was was uh, a, a problematic issue for Scotland, but I don't think the decision was taken for that reason. Um, it was it was perhaps a nice little bonus. Um, for the UK government. Okay. And, f and finally, um, just to ask uh, Dr Armstrong, uh, 
your quote from Alexander Hamilton at the start of your piece, is that issued as a kind of um, a warning or, or a visionary statement? Um, as a, an example from history of the sort of things that from uh, 250 years ago have been an issue and are still an issue today. This, this issue of uh, um, debt and shifting behavior, the, what we now call moral hazard, uh, has been around for hundreds of years. And to assume that it's not going to be around again in the future would be very brave. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Uh, thank you to uh, colleagues around the table. Uh, that's the end of our questions. I'm just wondering if um, our witnesses have any further points they want to uh, make before we wind up the session. No? Okay, well, thank you very much, actually, for your time and your contributions. Are uh, very much appreciated. Um, that being the only item on our agenda, I now close this meeting. <laughs>